on mute. I've done that. Uh, will I be heard? Yeah. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, good evening, all. Um, hope you can hear me all right. My name is Ger Woodcock, and I'd just like to welcome you all to the first uh, webinar 2022 uh, from the Department of Agriculture and Forestry webinars. And our title, of course, is Timber Products IFO Forestry Solutions Series. We have a, a range of speakers for you tonight, and uh, we'll be looking at uh, timber markets, specification of products, expansion of timber use, and bioengineering possibilities. I think even though we've heard a lot of uh, bad press uh, about the delays in the granting of licenses over the past two years or so, we will hear from our speakers tonight that forestry is still a very good investment. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our first speaker, Aidan Keeley from Murray's Timber Group. And Aidan will speak about the specification of timber products from a sawmill's point of view. So without further ado, Aidan, I hand you over the floor. Hello, everybody. My name is Aidan Keeley, and um, sorry, now I just want to get up this presentation. Hello, everybody. My name is Aidan Keeley, and um, I'm a timber buyer for Murray Timber. Um, I can everyone hear okay? We can hear you, Aidan. Oh, perfect. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, so, yeah, Aidan Keedy is my name. I'm a timber buyer for Murray Timber Group. And uh, today we're going to look at um, the steps taken from harvesting the tree in the wood, from processing it in the sawmill, um, and from selling it at the, the final product. Um, we'll, we'll also touch on uh, timber markets and um, timber products. So please uh, give your attention and we'll, we'll go through this uh, presentation here now. So uh, the first process uh, involved, that the sawmill is involved in, I suppose, is harvesting the timber at the wood. Um, and when harvesting um, timber in the wood, we're, we're looking, um, we're just looking to produce quality logs and to allow optimal production at the sawmill. Um, so I suppose, how can this be achieved? Um, I suppose all trees uh, should be harvested and extracted safely to avoid log damage. Uh, we must ensure that trees, um, sorry, no. Yeah. We, uh, we must ensure the, uh, the tree and the harvest requirements and log specifications um, are, are, are done. Um, all logs should be presented well. Um, all branches, uh, buttresses, and um, they should all be fully removed. Um, this may inquire the harvest operator to calibrate the harvesting machine to keep lengths right, and uh, maybe a chainsaw man present on site to, to tidy up uh, lengths. Um, all logs need to be clean going to the, to the sawmill. So this means they need to be free from stones, clay, and nails, because all these can cause interference at the mill when processing. So when the log gets to the mill, there's a bit of preparation to be done. Um, log preparation is carried out in the following ways. So debarking, butt reducing, and grading. The barking of all logs is required to produce a clean log for processing. It is, it is also important to keep the co-products separate. Your co-product co at debarking would be your, your bark material. Butt reducing is carried out to reduce taper. The aim is to present the logs as close to a cylindrical shape as possible to allow 
high production and maximum return when sawing. All logs are graded to a grading line. This separates logs according to their diameter. This process is key to, uh, to the sawmill as it allows to set up for particular diameters and the sawing pattern can be established in the sawmill. So we then move on to the processing of the log into the product. So each log is step fed one by one onto the processing line. Laser scanning set is carried out to place logs in the best position entering the processing line. This allows optimal cut and maximum return for log. Core products such as wood chip, sawdust and shavings are all extracted separately. Centerpiece and sideboards are kept separate. Every board is x-rayed, graded, not ratio, not, uh, for, for not ratio. Boards are sent for reject if, they're, if they do not fall into the required specifications. Timber is dried using innovative killing technology. Timber goes through a planing line or easy edge and plane all over is carried out. This allows a smooth finish to the sawn plank, which is, has proven to be a big success um, in the timber game over the past few years. Stacking is carried out automatically. Boards are bundled and wrapped and they're ready to be sold. So our timber products. Timber products can be broken down into three categories as follows. Main category would be construction timber. Mainly cut from the centerpiece of saw log, but can also be cut from the sideboard depending on log diameter and sawing pattern. This timber is produced at C16 grade. All boards are marked and stamped to show this. All boards are kiln dried to moisture content of 18 to 19%. I suppose green timber would be coming in at moisture content of low 40s to anywhere from low 40s to low 50s. So the kiln brings it down to that percentage for, for sale. Your fencing products. Fencing products is mainly cut from your pallet board. All timber is treated at the sawmill before it's ready for use. Um, then you've your pallet board. Your pallet board is generally cut out of the sideboards the log. It can be then cut, cross cut into shorter lengths for specific pallet board making requirements. I suppose just just looking at the at the construction timber, um, I suppose in forestry terms, mainly be your saw log uh, that produces uh, construction timber. Your four point nines would be the main one there. We also cut five point fives, six point ones, six point sevens, seven point threes. Um, construction timber can also be got from large diameter pallet wood, but mainly from saw log. Uh, your fencing products all mainly from your uh, 2.5s, your 3.1s, 3.7s, 3.4s. Um, just moving on then to your, your timber markets. Um, for us, we sell to three different markets. Um, our home market here in Ireland, the UK market, and the Northern Irish market. Timber markets have been extremely busy since early 2020, although there has been a slowdown in demand in the past few months. It was a clear pattern that when COVID came in, um, timber, timber markets got very busy. I suppose everyone was doing a bit more around their home and, um, yeah, extremely busy times in the in sawmill and uh, sector. Um, there is an increased demand for housing in Ireland. As a result, we hope uh, that demand for sawn timber and sawn products will improve over the coming months. Um, for me, timber timber's lowest, has the lowest carbon footprint of all building materials. For, and for this reason, I feel there's a, a bright future in, in timber products going forward. 
the, uh, the sawmills have invested heavily the last few years um, in their plants, and I'm aware that there's a there's a an increasing uh, volume of timber coming to the market, and I'm excited to say that the sawmills will be ready to to, to handle this timber going forward. I'd like to thank you all for your time. Um, I, I, and I'd also like to welcome you to, to check out our videos on our website, um, our videos of our sawmills uh, in full production on mtg.ie. And I'd like to, uh, to thank you and uh, I welcome all questions. From the moment a farmer plants a young sapling, the hope is you will one day be sending that tree to a sawmill to produce top quality logs. And when that day comes, you might well be calling Aidan Keeley. My name is Aidan Keeley. Um, I work for Murray Timber Group as a timber buyer. Murray Timber Group have been operating for 35 years and have two sawmills in Galway and Carlo, servicing the Irish and overseas market with FSC certified timber. Paddy Murray, um, established the company and um, he's, he, his sons are involved now um, with the company. Um, over the last few years it's been uh, a, a steady investment um, you know to to uh, have a sawmill that in many people's eyes is state-of-the-art. Born in Kinnity, County Offaly, Aidan has always had a grow for forestry. I come from uh, a village of Kinnity which I it's at the foot of the Sleeve Blue Mountains and um, timber was always a big thing in my area. Um, I was working at timber since I was 12 years of age. Really? Yeah, I was, yeah. Right. Um, Doing what, Aidan? Well, time? I was working in a, in a, in a small-scale sawmill um, okay. back in Kinnity. And, um, yeah, look, um, when it came to filling out the CEO farm, forestry was definitely a thing for me, yeah. My, my my job is to keep timber in front of the sawmill. So um, I buy timber in three different ways. Um, one is delivered in. That's when the when the forest owner cuts um, and transports the timber to the sawmill directly himself. Uh, number two is roads roadside sale. That's when um, the the grower or landowner harvests the timbers themselves, uh, puts it on the roadside and. I collected from there uh, with lorries and delivered it to the mill. And the third way, and probably the most common way, um, would be to buy timber standing. That's where I come in, I uh, assess the timber, I look at it in terms of percentages of um, saw log, pallet, stake and pulp. Um, I do a general assessment on um, the quality of the timber um, and I base my prices off that to the grower. Um, then if the, the grower pre uh, proceeds, what I do is I organise the harvesting contractor to cut and the, the lorry men to, to haul. Usually, the forest owner has already done a pre-sale assessment with his local producer group or private forester. Aidan will take that information and do his own survey before making an offer to the forest owner. But the one thing that makes a key difference to the price paid to the woodland owner is proper management. I suppose the day of of man or woman planting their site and uh, closing the gate and coming back in 30 years' time, that that day that day is gone. To be fair, um, it's very important um, when they're planting to make sure their crop is establishing well um, to ensure that the the management is in place, that um, that the grower is going to carry out thinnings correctly, um, planning in terms of forest road and access, that's all in place. 
um, to just for the for the forest grower or management company to be proactive in managing the sale um, as it matures and the whole way up really to be honest with you. Um, I know I know from my experience that when I go out to a, a grower, you know, I, I know when a grower is proactive in their in their management. Uh, a forest grower from from year zero to whatever year they clear fill at, really they're looking to produce the a high percentage soil at a clear fill time. That's that's really what's what it's about. A good quality saw log at a clear fill stage and um, by being proactive in, in, their, in management you can achieve this you know? yeah. Once the timber has been managed properly to saw log quality it is then harvested. The timber mills are most efficient when the tree coming through closely resembles cylinders. So we're just here at a, a stack of spruce which is freshly cut um, and the, the timber here um, is well presented as you can see the, um, the chainsaw man has has towed the, um, this log here, which is um, which is, is of good quality now and can go to our mill uh, quite easily. Some of the trees in this wood are too big for the harvesting machine, so it is the job of an experienced hand on a chainsaw to step in. Importantly for the forest owner, there is full traceability of each load that leaves the forest. When the lorry um, goes to the site, yeah. he leaves a forest permit in the in the docket box. Okay. Um, when that lorry goes to sawmill, um, he'll print a weight docket to go with the forest permit that he has already supplied to the grower. And that is then traced back um, to that load and the that, that's how the, the private grower has traceability for every load of timber that leaves his wood. In the next few years, wood coming from privately owned forests will outstrip the supply from state forests. This will place the private grower at the forefront of the timber supply chain in Ireland and Aidan Keeley will be on hand to help out. Sorry, Jar, if you could just uh, unmute yourself there, please. Um, can you hear me now? That's perfect, Jar. Yeah, perfect. if you start again, yeah. thank you. Yeah, okay. No, I'd just like to thank Aid on there for a, a fantastic report, good comprehensive report, and uh, it made it all the more interesting to see the film afterwards. Um, I'd now like to introduce uh, a farmer, Jim Walsh, forestry owner from Kilkenny, and he, he has a video as well, but his main, his main message here is Clearfell and his experience with forestry. So Jim, I'll leave it over to you. Thank you. Jim Welch's father planted Poor's Hill in the late 1980s with a mixture of pines, larch, spruce and Douglas fir. Planting this poor ground with forestry meant that the cattle were no longer grazing on this land and the red water soon disappeared from the cattle. There would be a problem with uh, red water in cattle. There would be ticks in that and we didn't know it until it was all planted and fenced off yeah. and the red water in the cattle stopped happening at yeah. that time. So that was a great plus to begin with, yeah. with the forestry. Yeah. Yeah. And it was just nice seeing it growing yeah. Then over the years, you know. We all would have weeded the trees as children growing up, you know, and helped planting and okay. uh, putting rock phosphate okay. around the trees to get them started because the ground was very poor. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I would have started tinning myself with a chainsaw, but it wasn't long before I realised 
I could give the rest of my life in there with a chainsaw. <laughs> so the machines came in then. Jim is a dairy farmer with a herd of 80 cows. So when the time came for organising the Clearfell on Poor's Hill, his local producer group was on hand to help. Well, yeah, we had found different contractors as we were doing the thinning stages. Yeah. And then the Irish wood producers was set up yeah. and I became a member of that. And from there I got to know the people working in that and I thought it was the best thing to do. It's a cooperative Basically, farmers helping farmers to yeah. get the most from their woodland. Yeah, yeah. So I went with them and there was very little organising for me to do then. It made it easy. So I was very happy with, yeah. with what, they, what they've done and they're, they've been very transparent in, in where timber goes and how much I was getting for it and yeah. who's going to be doing the work. Yeah. The site was cleared in two phases, and thanks to a strong market for wood products, Jim's earnings exceeded expectations. Well, per tonne, we were looking at 79 euro last year when we done the first half of the clear fell. Yeah. And this year went up to 115 for the second half of the clear fell. So that was a huge difference. And it's a bit like selling cattle you could hang on and hang on, but the prices might go down as well as up. So yeah, yeah. Um, that's that's the way it goes. We got lucky this year with the price. Yeah, yeah. Um, Seventy nine a ton was good, but obviously that was very good. Yeah, but one hundred and fifteen. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that was exceptional. Like yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, we we're delighted with that, and yeah. I suppose per acre that would it. When you do the sums and when you have to re re-establish the trees again, yeah. it's working out at nearly two hundred euros an acre okay. per year over forty years. Okay. So that's even better than than beef, you know, or even to let land. Yeah. Yeah. You you'd just about get that. So a short drive from Poor's Hill in Dunamagan, Jim has twenty hectares of Sitka spruce. I applied for a license just three years ago for another tinning. Uh, it should have been tinned three years ago, but we're still waiting yeah, for yeah. that license to come. So yeah. hopefully not too far away. I asked Jim if he would encourage others to plant. So if you have marginal land, I think it's a really good option. Right. Yeah. Um, or land that's not accessible to your farm. Or yeah. 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 It's a longer term investment, but it does pay off. Like. I, I guess you got to be watching the prices at the time of Clearfell. No point Clearfelling when prices are low. Um, but there's a bit of luck in it too, like everything, you know. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And you kind of make your own luck as well, Jim, don't you? You can do. You can control it to a certain extent, but yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. prices can go up and down pretty quick in any in any business. So. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. yeah, yeah, it it's easier work than dairy farming. I would say that. Right. Yeah, you don't and have to be up early in the morning <laughs> for the trees, you know. <laughs> Jim enjoys being a woodland owner and appreciates both the work done by competent contractors and the joy of using your own wood. I'd be I'd be watching the machines all the time. I'd call around every day seeing what they're how it's happening and it's pretty amazing the big machines how fast they can work. Yeah, yeah. You yeah. know, and, and seeing a good operator choosing the right trees, yeah. and they generally are very good uh, at it. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. And do you keep any of the timber for yourself? Do you like do you use any of the wood for firewood or for or for making anything yourself? Jim? Yeah, I have a uh, sawmill at home, which I don't use that often now, but I have kept some timber just for sawn for stakes or timber for sheds and things like that, yeah. yeah. Must be a nice yeah. feeling. It is, it is, yeah. It, it is good to know that you grew it and you're sawing it and now you're using it in a shed or, and with the price of timber now at the moment, it pays too, you know. Yeah.
Thank you very much for that, Jim. Uh, the video told it all. Um, you're not just a commercial timber man. You love the scene. You love walking it. You have a sawmill at home. I think you, you really live the forestry game. I'm told there's an awful lot of questions piling up, so I won't I won't uh, delay any longer. I'm going to introduce now our next speaker to you. That's Donald Magner, no stranger to forestry. We read him every, we read him every week in the Farmer's Journal. He's going to talk about processed timber products in construction. So Donald, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thanks, Chair. Just one second till I get this up. Okay, can you see that? Yes, we can, Don. Okay, great. Um, uh, the title of my talk, as you can see, is Homegrown, uh, Current um, Markets and Future Markets for Irish Timber. <clears throat> Sorry, um, Don. Sorry, Donald, the actual presentation hasn't come up yet. Oh? Yeah. I can, I can see it here, but... Um, Oh, just one second. Is it, can you see it now? Yes, perfect. That's great. Okay, great. I'll just get back to the start. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I'm really talking about homegrown timber and um, that's the subject for this evening. And I'm really celebrating the difference here between what happens in Ireland and in most other European countries. Um, so I'm going to divide the talk up into a brief history. Um, also, I'm going to talk about a unique situation in Ireland, which we have um, because we are um, uh, different from other European countries in that we've had a huge input for private planting, mainly state, in the last uh, number of years. I'm also going to talk about timber processing in Ireland. Uh, Aidan has touched on the sawmilling perspective. I'll just do a brief talk on that because Aidan has covered it. Um, I'm going to talk about current markets, <clears throat> uh, opportunities and risks, and future markets, also opportunities, risks, and uh, the challenges that we face um, in the next uh, few years as well. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> One thing I think you'll know from driving around the country, uh, the Irish climate and Irish soil conditions can grow a diverse range of tree species. What we are unique in Europe is that we have a very limited range <clears throat> of native species. <clears throat> very few species made it uh, to Ireland from the continent. Uh, just oak, elm, ash, Scots pine, birch and alder would be what you'd call the main, uh, if you like, commercial broadleaves. We have about 15 or 16 more other native species, but you wouldn't class them as, as uh, commercial trees. So we've only got one conifer, Scots pine, and all the other species that you see around, such as there are other species of spruce, sycamore, sweet chestnut, most of those just didn't make it, so uh, were introduced by man. So <clears throat> foresters over the last 100 years or so have been faced with a limited number of native species. So they've looked elsewhere. Um, first of all, they looked to Europe for Norway spruce, larch, pine species, beech, sweet chestnut, then to Japan. But the big uh, movement in Irish forestry was when uh, Augustine Henry looked at a climate more or less on the same latitude as Ireland, uh, maritime climate. And that's where we pick up a lot of uh, most of our species. These were uh, established about 100 years ago in trial plots in Wicklow, and um, they discovered from that that the climate in that west of North America, if you, if you draw a line from Queen Charlotte Islands in uh, Canada, right down to uh, Oregon and even further south to California, these are the species 
that were introduced to Avondale and grew extremely well. As a matter of fact, I've been over there and um, Sitka Spruce, for example, grows much faster in, um, in, in Canada and in the United States than it does, <clears throat> or much faster here than it does in the United States. Uh, foresters who visit here are amazed to see a 61 meter Sitka Spruce, 200 feet long. Uh, and when I tell them that uh, I drank tea as a forester, uh, with some of the workers who planted it, some of the elderly workers at the time who planted that species. So very briefly, we've got conifers, which are virtually all uh, non-native. You can see the list there, the spruces, the Douglas firs, the Montreal pine. I'll come back to those. Uh, and the broadleaves, we've just got oak ash, alder, birch and cherry, and then the other broadleaves are naturalized. <clears throat> so that species range has been further reduced because uh, European, Japanese, and hybrid larch are um, affected by the, um, the, just one second, I just put my, um, by the um, um, uh, Phytophthora disease and lodgepole pine is not planted really anymore because we no longer plant deep peats. Whereas if you go to the broad leaves, everybody knows uh, the position, the problem we've had with, um, with ash uh, and before that, Ellen. Um, so un another unique feature of Irish forestry has been the division between public forests and private forests. Up until about the early 1990s, the state uh, planted virtually 95% uh, of all forests. And since then, uh, the um, private sector has been planting virtually all the forests. Uh, and the breakdown of species with the private sector is about 70% uh, conifers, 30% broadleaves, that's since 2000. So Adon talked about uh, supply, and this is just basically what we've got at the moment. The recent forecast shows that uh, the total, if you look on the extreme right there, this is for the island of Ireland, we're around producing 4.74 million cubic meters of timber on the island at the moment. Um, and by the year 2040, we'll, we'll reach 7.6 million cubic meters. Uh, by 2030, we're almost close to 7 million cubic meters. And at, by that time, uh, private forests will uh, produce a bigger volume, that's if it reaches the marketplace, uh, than the total <coughs> of Quilta and the Northern Ireland Forest Service. Um, the breakdown of volume in that particular is 86% spruce, mainly Sitka spruce, lodgepole pine 4%, other conifers 5.6, and really we have very few broadleaves, just 2.6. So the emphasis is on, uh, as you can see from that, uh, spruce production. <clears throat> um, from a growth perspective, the big challenges are wood mobilization, getting the right species and getting the right quality and continuity of supply. Certification is also an issue, which is too detailed to go into tonight, but that is becoming a problem. And of course, as already mentioned by, by uh, two of the speakers, licenses is a, a problem that we should be able to solve once this project Woodland has reached its conclusion. From the timber processing side, it's all about capacity. <clears throat> uh, it's about markets, not only here, but in the export markets as well. Adon, uh, as you, you've heard, uh, Murray's will, will export a sizable volumes now to, to the UK, as do the other Irish sawmills. And there's also the challenge of innovation and developing new products. <clears throat> Just very briefly, I think it's worthwhile mentioning how Irish sawmilling and Irish timber processing has been literally transformed since the 1990s. Um, up until early 1990s, there was virtually, I think, around 150 mills, sawmills around the country. That has become rationalized over the years. There's still quite a few small sawmills, but there are five big players now, including the likes of Glennon's, um, ECC, uh, and Murray's. And all of those have state-of-the-art sawmills now. <clears throat> so we actually have uh, a sawmilling section that has become totally rationalized. Um, and as well as that, We've had, um, which I'll talk about as well, we have a timber processing uh, panel board sector, which is of inter international scale as well. So the sawmills are now well able to actually process the increased volumes coming on the market. And just very briefly, I did this up chart just to show you what actually happens on the whole market and what we import. 
if you look at the home processed, uh, most of that, uh, the sawmills goes to the structural market, uh, such as floor joists, cut roofs, timber studding, and a small percentage of it still goes to the prefabricated roof trusses. I'll talk about that later. Uh, fencing, of course, is a big market, both uh, squared and round fencing. Pallet has been a huge market, especially during the um, the um, uh, the pandemic for not just transporting food, but transporting medical medicine as well. And then there's the other markets, garden furniture. The imports are still in the hardwood areas and in the prefabricated roof trusses. I'll also discuss that later on. So because we've literally no uh, sizable hardwood market here, we depend totally on imports on that, but we are self-sufficient in softwoods. This is your, your normal house, which is, uh, which is uh, a, if this is a timber frame cut uh, house. And at the moment, uh, this is a major market for the sawmills. <clears throat> Could I say also that when the crash came in 2008, I was asked repeatedly, when are you going to be writing about the first sawmills that have uh, gone under? And actually none of the sawmills went under because they turned around from the domestic market, which was virtually went from 80,000 housing units down to two or 3,000 units, and they began exporting. <clears throat> uh, an average house, uh, about 20 cubic meters of sawn timber goes into a three bedroom house. And of that across the country, about 12 cubic meters is homegrown. Last year, 22,000 houses were built. Uh, and out of those were 5,000 uh, timber frame houses. Uh, so what we need to do in Ireland is to increase uh, not just the volume of timber going into timber frame, but in, to increase the timber frame housing market. For example, in Scotland, 60% of all houses now are timber frame, whereas Ireland needs to get to 30,000 houses annually. But at the moment, we're, we're, we're doing about 20%. So that's a, a huge market that's ready for the Irish sawmilling sector. Sorry about that. I've... Uh, accidentally gone out of my presentation. Just one second. So um, that is a huge market, as I said, available for uh, Irish sawmills. Uh, on the other side of that, um, as I said, for every um, log that goes into a mill, about 56% of it, maybe a little less, goes is sawn into various uh, sawn products. And the rest of that is really uh, pulp um, and uh, sawdust, bark, etc. And there are markets for all those pro 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 uh, products in Ireland. Uh, most of what we call the residue, which goes into medium density fiberboard, oriented strand board, door mouldings, and we have a, a panel board industry in Ireland that takes up all this. Um, for example, this is medium density fiberboard. Um, this is oriented strand board. And masonite, which is up in um, both of those mills are owned now by Quilta, whereas the big mill in Carrick and Shannon is the masonite mill, which makes mainly door mouldings, but other products as well. Uh, one of the things that we haven't fully developed in Ireland is wood energy uh, market. Uh, unlike countries like Austria, Denmark, um, and Sweden, who've got huge um, um, uh, timber markets for for uh, for energy, uh, we've stayed clear of it here, and I think that has got to change uh, because as the volume increase, so will the volume of uh, residue, wood chips, pellets, etc. And I think that's a market we need to look at. I was up in Leitrim recently, and McMorris and Macaulay's are two uh, uh, energy plants. They have capacity for 150,000 cubic meters, which is just a small fraction of the total market. And yet they could provide uh, energy for 400 businesses, each with an average output of 1,100 megawatts. Uh, this would displace in just that small uh, industry, would, would up in Leitrim would displace 56 million liters of oil per annum, creating employment and wealth in the local economy, which, um, which oil doesn't do. So what we have in Ireland is a good geographical spread of sawmills, uh, panel board mills with energy outlets. Uh, and that's, that is actually where you as growers will find your markets. You can see them right across there in all provinces and um, uh, all the sawmills now, as I said, are capable of taking on Swedish imports in the UK. UK, we're looking that it's the second largest uh, wood, wood uh, uh, import market in the world, second only to China. So all is well. Uh, 
but it's not really uh, because we do have problems. Uh, some of them were outlined earlier, such as the license, but also, which I'm not really going to talk about this evening because it's, it's an area that let's hope people will actually sort this, but uh, we do have other issues that we need to address. For example, I mentioned Sitka Spruce. This has been a huge success in Ireland. Uh, it has served the, the forestry and forest product sector, sector extremely well. But I think we've become over-reliant on this species and uh, we probably need to look at a species mix because we've seen already uh, countries <clears throat> right across Middle Europe which rely heavily on Norway spruce. And the Norway spruce has been attacked by the bark beetle uh, and it also is affected by drought. So that is a market. Uh, Germany, Austria now are looking again at what are they going to replace Norway spruce with. And we may very well have the same problem in Ireland, who knows, down the line. So I think we should diversify a little. <clears throat> and that means maybe bringing Scots pine back into the equation, Norway spruce, which is actually a beautiful uh, timber, and also Douglas fir, species like Western red cedar, Western hemlock, and Western um, and Monterey pine, which grow well here. I was struck again by Douglas fir uh, recently when I am um, um, doing a project with uh, students from the Technological University of Dublin. We're doing uh, seatings on the Seamus Heaney Walk in the Devil's Glen Forest. And I've asked the local sawmill here, uh, Pat Staunton, to give them some Douglas fir. And it actually shows again, it's absolutely a fabulous timber. And we grew it in huge numbers. It was formed for transmission poles uh, and for log cabins. And I think it's a species that we could look at again. And um, it's, it's resilient and it's got a beautiful reddish uh, color as well. Scots pine, as I said, we, I think is a species we should return to, maybe not in huge numbers, but there are areas where it should also, it also qualifies as a native woodland a tree in the native uh, woodland uh, afforestation scheme. Norway spruce, as I've mentioned on the right side, it is an extremely good tree. And we also have other species, just the Western red cedar, which was used here in the, um, in the Dava um, center up in uh, Northern Ireland and was a recent winner in uh, a competition that I organized called Wood Awards Ireland. And again, you can see here in the, um, Quilta offices, how they've brought together Norway spruce, um, beech, oak, and other species, pine in the windows. Uh, most of that is homegrown, and it just shows you how beautiful it is. Uh, <clears throat> so I'll return briefly before I finish on broadleaves, because I think, you know, there is going to be a demand now for owners in future to plant 30% broadleaves. So we need to be pretty sure what we're actually planting broadleaves for. There's no doubt that oak has tremendous um, um, value, but we're talking about rotations of over 100 years, alder, birch are shorter, and cherry shorter as well. But I think we've forgotten about the naturalized species like beech, sycamore, and sweet chestnut, which also have value. Um, I'm just going to say briefly that you probably, if you're reading the Farmer's Journal, you've heard something about carbon trading recently, where farmers are going to be, who plant are going to be actually compensated by giving a farm, a farm uh, uh, be allowed to trade their carbon. And that will actually uh, be a long-term incentive, I believe, for, for forest owners who plant broadleaves, uh, because there's no doubt that planting broadleaves at the moment doesn't, uh, doesn't offer a, a financial return, especially within the grant, within the premium period, which is only now 15 years. Um, so, as I said, although less than 3% of all timber production is hardwood, craft and design in hardwood is still very strong, as I've discovered uh, in that um, Woodward's Island. For example, oak, there's quite a number of people working with oak. Uh, that's uh, the renovation of the Great Hall in Carrick Fergus, which was grown from uh, Irish uh, oak that was actually fell, felled in a storm. And um, there's a beautiful craft work in this particular building. Um, this is the water wheel um, in Kilbegan Distillery. And uh, again, it's the, the, uh, this is larch and uh, oak combined. And again, Alan Meredith, who uses Irish oak and ash. Um, anybody familiar with Joseph Walsh Studio down in, um, in West Cork outside Kinsale shows how he is actually using, un unfortunately, his imported ash. And that's going to get scarcer as the years go on. So what does the future hold? Uh, there's certainly we're going to have to diversify with species. I think we're going to have to do much more research at forest level. We don't have a research, good research uh, institute in Ireland. Uh, we do have great work carried out by Tagish, but an awful lot of research is done on contract 
uh, basis, research needs to be much more long term in Ireland, and that involves three improvement programs. Some of this work is already underway and has been carried out by uh, by Tagish and Nunsahardi Industries. Uh, Alder as well needs needs work on this. Uh, also, we need new product research, especially into engineered wood and small wood, uh, small hardwoods. And as I said, certification is something we we need to tackle. Uh, as you know, with uh, most sawmills can take in uh, up to thirty percent um, a, a non-certified timber, but they need now to actually um, uh, much more uh, private growers need to be certified. And I know the producer groups are are doing that, uh, are carrying out some projects on certification. Just very briefly on product. Uh, um, uh, new product development. This is work by NUI Galway, who have studied um, uh, using C16 Irish Sitka spruce to produce cultural, uh, structural cross laminated timber panels. Uh, now, I know the next speaker will be talking about this, but already <clears throat> um, we are seeing huge pro uh, uh, projects being carried out. For example, there's an 80 meter building in Austria at the moment which is 75% cross-laminated engineered timber. And this one here, um, your Tarnet, which is in, uh, in Norway, is again 85 meters uh, tall, and it uses 80% Norway spruce, which is a first cousin of our own Sitka spruce. And all that timber in Norway was sourced from a, a range of 50 mile, 15 miles. So that is, that is huge. That kind of building is going to have much more emphasis now as we talk about climate change and displacing fossil-based materials such as cement, cement and steel. So the markets. Uh, wood mobilization remains a strong challenge for, for the private sector. I'm glad to see that, that we are having webinars like this to show that the main thing, as, as one of the speakers has said, the days of shutting the gate and waiting for your timber to come on the market are gone. You need to actually uh, tin it early, tin it often before you get to the clear felling stage. And the sawmills need that type of mobilization. They need that continuity of supply. As I said, we need to address species diversity. We need to address certification, which would be a major issue as private supply has already exceeded the 30% threshold. And there are also regulatory issues need to be tackled by growers and by the department as well, such as the licenses, which we've already mentioned. For the timber processing sector, the good news is that the mills, the major mills have the capacity as do the, the panel board mills to process the increased volumes, which will double over the next 20 years. They also have developed markets. And in many ways, the, the recession was a blessing in disguise because it meant that mills had to look outside Ireland and they have done this. Uh, most of the sawmills now are exporting 65% plus, uh, whereas the panel board mills, which produce OSB and Medite uh, and door molds are exporting 95%. Uh, innovation, we need to increase domestic and market, market share, and especially we need to get involved in timber frame houses. This is a huge market at the moment, as I said, uh, about 40% uh, of every timber frame house is, uh, is, uh, is, uh, is imported. We also need better data on market trends and prices. As I write for the Farmers Journal, it's really almost embarrassing for this sector which anybody who picks up the farmer's journal will get sheep prices, dairy prices, beef prices, but we will not get timber prices. And uh, Quilta don't supply them at the moment for, for uh, confidentiality reasons, but the private sector, I believe, and Quilta should combine and issue uh, monthly timber prices for standing and uh, delivered in timber. So that's really my presentation. I'd like to thank you for uh, listening and um, I, see some questions coming in. So I'll try and get to those later on. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Don, for uh, uh, an excellent presentation. Uh, you covered many, many topics there. I said there'll be a few questions coming in. All right, Don. Um, the carbon topic is also, I think, a huge one going forward. I'd say we'll, we'll have questions there. As time is against us, um, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to introduce our final speaker. Professor Michael Morris from Trinity College Dublin. And Michael will speak about developing biocircular concepts for timber and wood. And what are the challenges there in moving from renewables to circular? So, Michael, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, hi, thanks. And uh, uh, I'll move as quickly as I can so just to give people a, a flavor of uh, 
I guess what's coming down the line, a, a very top down view, I think, to complement some of the things that, that Donald talked, talked a little bit about. Um, and that is how timber and wood products can really contribute to the change in society and the way we uh, operate uh, our economies that's going to happen over the next 20 or 30 years. Um, so this slide just kind of tells I'm a material scientist. Um, uh, I'm funded uh, with a number of Irish scientists on a project called Next Gen Wood uh, by DAFM, looking at some of these uh, alternative and higher value uh, products from wood that are going to uh, emerge over the next uh, 10 to 20 years. And uh, here's a couple of examples of work that I'm doing. So one is generating and making wood transparent as an alternative window material. Um, so replacing plastic and glass as high carbon products. And the other one is looking at a really high value product and that's making membranes for filtration from things like uh, uh, lignin and some of the waste uh, material which uh, uh, goes from wood processing. So and that's why I'm talking today, but I really wanna talk about um, the concept of circularity as it applies to forestry and land. So um, I was gonna say what I know about forestry can be written on the back of one of these things. Um, but actually after tonight, I think I have know considerably more. So thanks all the speakers for that bit of education. So we've lived through two essential ages, the pre-industrial age, where we were very connected to things like ag agriculture and farming. Um, there were very few urban centers and that all changed in around 70, 73 because of this invention. It's nice to see that it's made out of wood as it would have been back then by John Kay called the flying shuttle. And this was a really simple device on wheels that as you spun fiber into textiles, that this thing would be held across to make the waft as the weave went down. And it essentially allowed us to make large volume or large area things like sail sheets. And that really triggered the start of the industrial revolution. And what we've been doing since then is just making, selling more and more stuff. And that's been the foundation of economics in that 200 years is just make and sell more stuff. And we've been sucked into this mass consumerism mass production, drive of prices down, but we've also been disconnected from both the extraction, be that the extraction of, of timber or mining products or plastic or oil, petroleum, and what we create as waste. And the circular economy and the sustainable age, which we're just entering now, which we need to do protect the climate, is about avoiding both extraction and waste within the kind of techno sphere, te technological sphere that we live in now. Why, sh why should we think about this concept? Well, land for forestry is pressurized and will continue to be pressurized, which will drive wood prices up. Um, we'll have 11 billion people on the planet by two, uh, the 22nd century. Even within 2030, we estimate that all resources will double in volume, um, which is enormous pressure on it. So we need more forestry, we need more arable land. And while Ireland has forested quite quickly, um, although that's been replicated throughout Europe, its growth is about 0.4% compared to say the growth of oil derived plastics, which is 15 times that. Um, 58% of the wood biomass in the US is used uh, uh, essentially uh, for other applications, so that be that construction, uh, and it contributes a significant amount of uh, GDP generation in Europe, around 7%. About 60%, 60-70% of all wood is harvested, but it's projected just to meet demand in 2030, that 60% overall efficiency will have to change to 
if we're just due to meet the current demands. So everything is going to drive prices up because land prices, etc. The circular economy is being developed essentially to drive us towards a system where we circulate plastics, where we circulate metals, uh, or we replace them with renewables. Uh, but this linear economy that we've used for the last 200s, where we take resources, we make them into things, we distribute them, we use them, and we throw away as got to end. That's the reason for climate change. It's the reason for all the environmental damage. Circular economy is an alternative to this, and I won't go through this. I haven't got enough time, but really it was coined by in the 1960s by this uh, economist slash philosopher called Kenneth Balding, who introduced the concept of the Earth being a spaceship which supports life and that that's how we should consider it so that everything we use is reused it goes to into the survival and the, of the world's population and that seems a very simple concept now but at the time we were right in the middle of just exploiting all of our natural resources in a way that's being developed into what we now call as the circular economy but it really is about just using what's available in a clever way. And um, we'll talk about action plans and I will talk about a definition. It's better probably to look at a few examples. This is uh, the Bingen copper mine in Utah. Uh, it's the biggest open cast mine in the world. It's about one and a half kilometers deep and about four kilometers in all directions at the top. And it's used to make copper which is then thrown away uh, by us all. Yes, we try to recycle some of it. We try not to throw it away, but still we mine a huge amount of copper because we're not very efficient in avoiding the use, scrapping it and reclaiming it. Whatever it is, we're, we're just simply not able to do that. You should think about the circularity of things like land and forestry. and. Uh, Donald touched on carbon and carbon emissions and carbon taxes, but the biggest source of emissions in the last 50 years was the translation of forest to crop. Um, that is the single biggest contributor to climate change if we look at the five year period. We've also got to remember that most of our crops are uh, fertilized uh, essentially by ammonia products which are natural gas and oil derived but without that of the food production and across the globe would reduce by a factor of two to three um, and we just couldn't feed ourselves now as population grows there's going to be more uh, demand for arable land shortage and that's going to increase the pressure on forestry uh, which by necessity will probably have to decrease over the next 50 years. So we have to think of some form of, of bioeconomy strategy, unless we take something slightly more drastic, which I think anyone who's watched an Avengers film, Thanos took the view that we just exterminate half the population. That's probably not going to be an effective way forward. And, and this is kind of the circular economy for forestry. And I think of people that said, what we're trying to do translate some of the wood products and get rid of the technological, the oil derived, fossil fuel derived materials that we're using at the moment and generating them from forestry, from biomass, uh, etc. And you can see something that people talked about, no gas, that's essentially burning wood for energy. Um, I take a contrary view think that's disastrous uh, strategy to think about us doing that uh, and hopefully I'll explain why in a while. Land is all important uh, and the pressure on land prices will drive forestry prices up and that's because we don't live on a planet when we have a huge amount of space even in countries like America that we think about as having huge open spaces for exploitation we can't just chop down forests anymore to balance and to grow uh, things like food production. Some figures there to do it. 
But one of the things that we've got to do is actually price things properly. So if we look at the technological products like plastics, like alloys, if we just think about plastics, they are incredibly cheap. Um, I, I, I think there was a price there of, uh, uh, of wood. Plastic is often cheaper than wood. And the reason plastic's cheaper is that no one pays the cost. No company pays the cost of cleaning up after itself. Taxes and other subsidies allow us to collect waste and dispose of it in as safe a way as possible. So one of the things that we are going to see is harmonization of tax so that the producers of non-biological materials actually pay the full price for cleaning up after themselves. And that will generate the kind of differential that will allow us to drive uh, a bioeconomy in a meaningful way, because we're simply not doing that at the moment. And here's an example of some um, recycling uh, and the concept of circularity. So uh, we take forest, we, we know it needs to be fertilized. Um, and where we get that fertilizer from is the ash that comes out of a wood-fired power station. So we get this circular um, process where we take uh, ash from a fertilizer plant, we use that to fertilize new trees, we harvest those trees, they generate energy, and the waste then generates the fertilizer to grow. So you've got this concept, even within natural cycle, natural biomaterials to increase the circularity, to increase what we do, make it more efficient and cheaper and more sustainable for the planet. There are lots of challenges in terms of this. Um, we can have a look at something, right? So uh, here's my football team shirt, which is labeled from uh, natural fibers, which are cellulose derived fibers. Um, but actually, it's not really circular because they're thrown away uh, 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 into dustbins at the end of the time. We've heard things like EasyJet saying that their planes produce 22% less emission than other planes, uh, which is just a lie. Um, what it, they do is they carry 22% more people, so it does become 22% more efficient, but it's exactly the same petrol and uh, 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 diesel that fires them as any other plane. And then, of course, we've got this concept of people like Hewlett Packard selling us things which we throw away uh, every month or so uh, for huge prices. So we've, we've changed in ideas. Um, our technology, right? So uh, as I said, I, I, I lead a research pack, uh, a program funded by DAFM. Um, is just emerging. So these solutions aren't going to appear in the next three, four, five years. You know, we're looking at things which are 10 years away. But if we think about some of the figures that we need to look at, we need to replace, there's a world shortage of plastic, there's a world shortage of recycled plastic. Um, and contrary to what we're led to believe, we recycle very little. So when we drink out of a Coke bottle, only 2% of all those bottles go back to making bo bottles. Um, extremely short amounts. And biopolymers currently are less than 5% of the market. So there's a great opportunity for timber to really intersect that and make a contribution uh, to changing the way we live. We have to think about uh, measurement and how we measure things. As I said before, we can greenwash, we can call figures, we can call carbon numbers, but there's no standards for how they're arranged. We have to count all the resources that are, that are in a process and we have to be consistent. And because we're inconsistent, we get some very strange figures emerging from Europe because of the non-valid. So uh, one of the things Donald talked about was renewable energy. Um, the action plans through Europe uh, suggest that biomass will account for 42% of the 20% renewable energy target. But if we are to re realize that from wood, 
that means that all the wood currently harvested in the EU would go to energy production. And that's never going to happen because when we do that, when we burn wood, whatever form it is, whatever we do with it, it actually negates its climate benefit. Wood is the best source of carbon dioxide fixation, of taking carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere that we've got. And as soon as we burn it, we release that carbon dioxide back. So burning is not a good idea um, in the short term or the long term. And I think other strategies have to be invested in. Um, I won't talk about how difficult it is, I think Donald highlighted some of the things that we have to do for forestry to help help this process. Um, we have to develop funding and investment. And a lot of that investment, as we've seen, has been private. But if we're really going to value and upvalue wood as a raw material, we need incredible research. And Ireland as a country hasn't done that. Uh, we must encourage people to talk. Uh, together to understand the views and what can be done and what can't be done and to have proper figures. We still have to optimise uh, resource yields. And I think Donald touched on that by the selection of some of the tree species uh, to actually in both optimise return, but optimise what we're going to do to the planet in terms of things like biodiversity. So it, it, the key things which aren't being addressed or addressed well enough at the moment. I will really talk about land use, but I think one of the things that we've talked about is how you extract forestry from uh, land, which is neither good for building or good for farming. And I think that's a critical, critical aspect as we go forward. So just to finish, I've tried to be as fast as possible. I hope uh, some of my messages haven't been led by that. And um, this is something which is going to be really rely on enormous government investment. And the changes that are going to happen uh, across all aspects of society and the economy are going to be enormous. And I think we have to start talking to people and ensuring that people understand the role that our natural environment has in enabling a more, uh, a more careful and considered economic uh, scenario for all of us. So that's, that's the end of my message, and I hope that's been uh, uh, clear enough for people to follow in the limited amount of time. Thank you very much, Michael, uh, for a most enlightening presentation. I must say there's a lot of new concepts there that I haven't heard of tonight, and it's uh, very educational. I said there might be a question or two there. As time is against us, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I know there's one or two questions that haven't been answered, and I would ask Alex Kelly now to target them maybe to the, the relevant speakers. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, basically, I think most of our presenters, thank you so much. You've answered most of the questions as they've come up. Um, so anybody who didn't see the Q&A, just have a look down through some of the queries and the responses. Um, I think Donal has one query he said he might answer. It was not, not a difficult question at all. It's on carbon credits um, and how that process might work in the future. So I just asked Donal if he'd like to address that question. Thanks, Alex. Um, yeah, I think the question was uh, that existing, which Theresa, I think, asked it was that existing uh, would existing forest owners receive a carbon payment? Um, this, is, this is a particularly difficult issue at the moment because unlike the UK, we, we haven't actually developed a forest carbon code in Ireland. Um, and um, what, what the Society of Irish Foresters has put forward recently is that, uh, that a forest carbon code uh, would be developed to uh, provide farmers uh, and I suppose other uh, forest owners with a carbon trading platform whereby they could sell carbon either to the to the voluntary private market or even even to the state. Uh, the report uh, puts the value of carbon uh, as 32 euros a ton, which it is in 2021. But I but um, I think the climate change uh, body uh, 
reckoned put in their proposal to the government and said that carbon will be priced somewhere around 100 euros per cubic per ton by 2030 and 265 by ton by 2050. This would provide huge payments for farmers uh, who this would be in addition to um, to their income from timber sales. Now it would involve a different type of forestry. It could involve much more long-term forestry, but where I see benefits would be for farmers uh, and other forest owners who might get involved in, um, in planting native species and planting broadleaves where the rotation length is extremely long, <clears throat> but where carbon sequestration would have its own unique type of um, um, uh, value. Uh, now, the question I think <coughs> was asked, that do, would existing forest owners uh, receive that carbon payment? And as far as I'm aware, it would only apply to, once it's established, it would apply to uh, uh, owners of land who would a forest or who would get involved in new planting. So it wouldn't apply to uh, uh, owners of existing forests. It's a, it's a very complex issue, Alex. As you know, we're just beginning to explore it in Ireland. And, um, and unlike England, it's very much likely that we will use the UK carbon code, which is up and running. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Yes, uh, we have a few action groups, I think, that have been assembled in the last couple of months as well in Ireland. So uh, it's, it's, uh, it's only getting going, I think, as you said. So thank you, Donald. Um, and we had one other question as well that I think um, Michael was going to address. Uh, it's around uh, crop rotation um, and nutrients in the soil and using different species to, to maintain nutrition. So, uh, Michael. Yeah. yeah, Teresa, thanks for the question, because I think, think that's a great question. I think that's the whole concept of uh, circularity is really regenerating uh, the, the soil as well as the, the trees. So avoiding unnatural fertilizers, using natural fertilizers and things like the old idea uh, of crop rotation where we alternate uh, that. Of course, that raises value because things like hemp, as you said, they, are, they, they do form biomass, which that biomass will increase in value all the way, uh, all the way through. So, uh, yeah, I think that's a great suggestion. Okay, thank you very much, Michael. Um, and we also have Oshin O'Connell has another qu query uh, around, around the same thing about regenerative agriculture, uh, agroforestry, um, creating more understories. And we, now we do have another webinar looking at this as well, so we don't have to answer all the questions tonight, but it's, it's along the same lines. Um, so it's, it's basically about thinking outside the box and looking at bringing other species in rather than just going with the same plan all the time. So it's long-term plans and management of... Yeah, of I I, I think regenerative farming is is a, a, a well established concept, and and also the concept of vertical farming, where we we look at uh, how we maximise the things that we do. Um, but again, I, I I can't overestimate the fact that the the, the greatest the, the greatest benefit to any any arable any arable farming is the use of fertilisers of some description. In the future, we'll probably be able to make them from water and air uh, as we develop those technologies but uh, I, I think we have to be realistic about some of these these concepts and what they'll deliver because we don't have the real quantitative data that enables us to to look at the, uh, judge sometimes whether these are good decisions or bad decisions Thank you, Michael. And we have, we'll just take one more question from Jay, who's had several questions around climate change. Um, and again, the way things, we're gonna to have to change the way we are managing forestry uh, going, going forward. Climate change is already happening um, about infrastructure and grant systems. But I think we have to go even back before that to some of Jay's earlier questions, which was about basically species selections and what we're going to, you know, what are we going to do going forward? And it's obviously, we, there's been several conferences organized um, already by the site of Irish Foresters looking at this and the last one was talking about species selection and, and what we're going to do. So that's why we would encourage all of our forest owners to think more about what they're going to do long term. And um, we can't just go with the same plan all the time. We're going to have to evolve quite, quite quickly, I suppose. We are looking at this at one of our later webinars. So I, it, it, that's probably enough for we call it, a, a, bring it to a close this evening, Ger, if that's okay. 
Great. Thank you, Alex. Um, it all remains for me now is to thank the audience for tuning in, and I hope you all learned something from the evening. I'd like to thank the Department of Agriculture. I'd like to thank uh, Chris Hayes from Cranogue, and of course, our speakers uh, were excellent on the night. Aidan Keeley, Jim Welsh, Professor Michael Morris, Donald Magner, and at last but by no means least, Alex Kelly, for uh, pulling the strings together in the background for all these meetings. Uh, I think we'll be tuning in again next week. So uh, until then, I'd like to say good night and keep safe. Thank you. <laughs>